Okay, so first time PowerPointer, first time speaker, so you know, usual self-deprecating disclaimer. So uh, yeah. So comedic sound design, you already saw that video. Uh, as Gord said a little bit, who am I? Um, I'm a technical sound designer, which you know means I do sound design, but also use WISE a lot, I guess. Um, I went through the Vancouver Film School a bunch of years ago here and uh, graduated 2011. And um, at some point in 2012, found myself working in game audio around Seattle. Um, I've stayed there since. I was at Microsoft for a little bit, working on a game called Project Spark. Um, I was doing contract audiobooks and stuff for Audible for a bit. I was uh, doing a bunch of random little iOS games. I got the opportunity to collaborate with a group called Wabi Sabi Sound and do some work um, on a couple of games. Lichdom Battle Mage, like a first person spell slinger type thing. Um, an MMO type thing called Skyforge that still seems to be going pretty strong. Um, Facebook games, iOS game called Nords. And I got to put like maybe a dozen sounds total in The Witness, which is pretty rad. And then I took a job and couldn't do it anymore, but I'm sad. And I really want to see how that turns out in a few months. Um, it's going to be cool. And now I'm at PopCap, which I've been at since February. Um, that was a big change for me. Uh, going to mobile in this totally sort of different aesthetic, shooting for, you know, people playing on buses and younger audiences and folks that get into more casual games. PopCap does... Um, Plants vs. Zombies and Bejeweled and Peggle. Um, those are their three main IPs. Yeah. Um, and they have a crack shot audio team there that I'm real fortunate to be a part of. Um, so while I'm there, I've been doing uh, a lot of character design, a lot of systems design, um, some audio lead outsourcer management type stuff. Um, it's been exciting, but I've had to really start thinking about making funny sounds um, for my project for the last several months, which was totally new for me. And uh, why this talk is basically because, well, uh, a couple weeks ago I ran into Gord at Bungie and they didn't have anybody. So he just said, we're looking for speakers. Do you want to come say something? And I'm like, okay, what should I talk about? I don't know, whatever you want. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about funny sounds this year and I don't see a lot of people talk about it. So hopefully this is useful to you guys. Um, I tend to overanalyze everything, so it's fun to look back and get to do a lot of research that would fill up a PowerPoint that makes it look like I had a plan when I went in on making these sounds. But honestly, it was a lot of gut checking. And then in gathering stuff for this, um, I feel like I found a good amount of stuff that kind of corroborates, you know, why things are funny and hopefully why, why sounds can be. So uh, what makes a funny sound? Well, there's really no hard and fast kind of way to do it. Um, it's like how good a sound is, is a less useful term, I would say, than um, whether it's like the right sound or not, like with all sound design. It sort of um, depends on the situation. Um, all the foley that you heard in, you know, the Gangnam style replacement without music really wouldn't be funny if it were fully in a period drama where, you know, like, I don't know, the King's speech, you totally expect to hear him with creaking floorboards. Um, you know, putting a badass explosion in Gears of War or something like that isn't really going to be funny, but putting a super crunchy, hyper-realistic explosion in Peggle when it's sitting a bunch, a bunch of like squidgy kind of unicorn sounds would be a little out of place and maybe hilarious if done the right way. The thing is that we rely on, you know, visuals and expectations and, uh, and context a whole bunch when we're trying to figure out how to make funny sounds. Um, context is key. The audience you're pitching to is key. Uh, and if there's one thing I think I'll keep coming back to, it's uh, the best way to make funny sounds is to just kind of be a funny person, <laughs> which seems like a really crappy bit of advice. But, um, well, you know, as we'll sort of see and go on um, in my sciencey stuff section, there's a lot uh, of research that seems to talk about humor dealing with expectations and subverting them and subverting context. And um, I'll just go into all this stuff. So this is all things, these are things that, you know, didn't like necessarily or consciously inform my process of trying to make funny sounds beforehand, but they might get to inform yours. They're certainly going to change how I think about making funny sounds as I keep going. Um, but I've always been a guy who I think has tried to just cope with being funny for most of my life. So I think stepping into this role was kind of normal. So laughter. Um, anyone remember these stupid cartoons? I don't know. 
on Hallmark cards and stuff everywhere. Okay, um, that was that was really funny. Uh, cool. So laughter, as it turns out, um, is a function that grew up in our lizard brains far apart from the centers that govern um, lots of our other logical thought processes. Um, you can't really stifle a laugh once it starts to come up, much like you can't really stop a sneeze, and nor can you really force a sneeze. And people who force laughter are like some of the most nauseating individuals ever. Um, you know, maybe everybody knows that guy, but I had a friend that, uh, you know, wouldn't really laugh at things genuinely or allow himself to, but he always did that thing where he'd go, that's really funny. And it's just like, dude, if it were funny, you'd just laugh at it. Like, stop, you know, you just want to choke him when it's like, oh man, that's good. No, it's, it's not, dude. If it were, you just, you know. Um, laughter, as it turns out, is used for communication. We apparently learn how to laugh. I don't have a kid, so I haven't discovered this for myself. But way before speech begins to form, like laughter is four months, speech is, you know, a year and a half, two years. Um, so it's clearly quite important at an early age. Uh, and it's used for socialization. Um, you know, as it turns out, you are way more likely to laugh in a group and at socially accepted cues than you are to just kind of laugh by yourself when watching something. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my usual gut test for, you know, if something is truly, truly funny is whenever I laugh by myself, um, short of, you know, feeling like a crazed maniac, uh, you know, I usually will try to think like, oh my God, like what was that that was so good about that, that even with nobody else here, like, or a laugh track or any kind of cue, like it just broke through. Because in a group, the laughs just sort of flow. We're conditioned to do call and response things. There are cues, times to do it. Um, but by yourself, it seems a bit weird to laugh. I don't know, maybe you guys all laugh by yourselves and I'm just weird, I don't know. So yeah, why do you care about any of that shit? Well, I found a couple of articles um, whose authors I'm not going to list here because you know you don't know them. If you want to look them up, I can share them with you afterwards. And I found a couple of relevant quotes that seem to um, tie into you know my experiences with trying to make funny sounds. This is the part where I'm going to you know read text-heavy sessions. Many millions of years ago came a form of laughter that basically was triggered, and they observed this in primate apes, um, that signals, hey, this situation is not dangerous. Um, it's this real low-level form of communication that even when we do it kind of signals, oh, this, this context or this situation, there's actually no harm in it. We've sort of like sucked all the weight out of it. You can feel okay. You know, you can let down your guard. Um, Non-serious novelty is another thing that I underlined. The TLDR, that laughter signals the absence of danger. Kind of neat. Um, difficult to have something that makes you feel like you're going to scream in horror and still be funny at the same time. Uh, but if you do it, neat trick. So, why you care? Number two, another study. This is sort of speaking about laughter um, as something that's much more easily engaged when you're socializing versus alone. Um, the actual hard numbers are that participants in one or another study were 30 times more likely to laugh in the presence of others than when they were by themselves. But when they noted in their journals that they were truly alone, they recorded no laughter at all. Actually, I don't know why I freaking underlined that. The better sentence is, among the few solitary instances of laughter, nearly all occurred in response to TV shows or other media that is proxies for other people. So my kind of extrapolation of that could be, you're more likely to laugh in the presence. That's not really extrapolation. That's exactly what they said. Um, so... Uh, okay, in the notes leave lies my theory. Um, creating proxies for community and interaction and the feeling of other people being there via, you know, maybe characterization um, helps a ton with just easing the person into being able to laugh. This is perhaps why, and I found other studies that didn't link here, but things like mouth noises and nonsense speech um, are just so inherently funny by themselves because they are sounds that come out of people, which sort of puts you more in the same, you know, in that vibe, even if the people aren't there. Pro tip I'll come back to a bunch is that uh, mouth noises and nonsense speech are both really good and are kind of universal, just wins for being hilarious. Okay, why you care number three. So this is the least funny name of a theory about humor ever, um, the benign violation theory. So um, social psychologist slash 
I don't know, philosopher, whatever the term for it is. Schopenhauer posits that humor occurs when and only when three conditions are satisfied. The situation is a violation. The situation is benign. Both perceptions occur simultaneously. So that sounds really crazy and technical, and you know, there's a Venn diagram to accompany it, but I'm pretty sure in layman's term it translates to there is a thing that you think is happening, a situation that would otherwise be dangerous, uh, a joke that would be incredibly crude or something to say, but because of the context it's being presented in, there's some sort of subversion of that in which you realize, hey, that person is not actually being, I don't know, uh, pick your poison, um, whatever you're a fan of, like, you know, black humor is that somehow can still come across as funny because you realize it's sort of being done in jest or at the expense of the people who are really making it. Um, something like, hey, this situation seems really dangerous and this guy just shot rainbows and candy out of his gun. Like, that's a total violation of what I would have expected there. And it's also benign and harmless. So therefore, it's funny. You take a dangerous thing and kind of, again, duck the weight out of it. TLDR here, unexpectedly harmless subversions are often funny when done well. I think this is probably why it's so tough to be funny in a foreign language when you're learning it, because you don't, when you don't really know the context or the boundaries of the audience you're dealing with, it's tough to know where you can really intrude or not. So this comes to a lot of, again, you want to make funny sounds, just be funny. Being funny sort of requires knowing your audience and where you can go over the line and where you can, you know, go in the other direction and still feel safe and kind of hit that humor vein. So, um, yeah, and I feel like it's kind of cheap to say just like, just know how to do it. And that's the trick, but that's sort of the undercurrent. Um, anywho, that's the science-y stuff. Um, I brought a couple examples of what I feel are reasonably funny examples of sound design in games that are not mine. So this is from Red Faction Armageddon. There was a campaign where... If they got enough supporters, they were basically going to release a DLC of a gun called Mr. Toots. Damn it. Which is Doors the unicorn blocked. you see here. Knocking out the power sources should lower the shield generator. Not actually even the best part. The only way through is to destroy the power source. <laughs> that should do it. Alright, you guys get the picture there. Um, so why I would say that, I mean, that's the classic example of the, the subversion of expectations, the violation. First off, that unicorn shouldn't even physically be there, but you don't expect... Um, you know, anything to make those kinds of squeaky, goofy, sort of terrifying noises in a, in a game like Red Faction where the entire rest of the palette is different. So if you just need one-off humor, you can do one-offs in a totally different direction. And if they stick out enough and you sort of play your hand right, I think that can have a really big impact. Um, you know, there are also some kind of classic elements in the unicorn itself. I mean, honestly, that wouldn't really be that great standalone if you didn't also see the horrifying expressions that unicorn was making as he was like wrenching it around. <laughs> it's really kind of morbid. Um, but, uh, you know, you're never really going to be deliver in contextless sound design anyways. So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. You're generally going to get to be in on the joke, hopefully with the artist or something like that. Um, and if you weren't, and you just decided to make a gun sound like a farting unicorn when it looked like a real gun and you didn't tell anybody about it, like, you'd probably get fired, so. <laughs> so, another example um, comes from a game called Saints Row 4. Volition has a history of funny guns, as it turns out. So, I don't know if you guys, you probably have all heard of the dubstep gun. I didn't even notice the car is dancing. <laughs> so, 
So, kind of a cheap example just because it's actually music and not sound design, but again, that's sort of a sonic joke being played on uh, the player there. Um, you know, again, that's a specific type of humor, I suppose, you know, parody. Um, there are a lot of different subgenres of ways to be funny, um, and that one plays really well there because everybody who isn't sick of freaking dubstep in, you know, 2013. Um, so, yeah, there's really not much more to say about that other than I think that thing is really damn cool. Um, skip through these videos since they don't play. So one game that I feel like has a lot of great um, sound design that's just kind of out and out funny almost by itself, almost without the visuals, um, is Jazz Punk. I don't know if any of you guys have experience with it. Uh, it's kind of a weird, very adult swim, Ren and Stimpy themed kind of like 60s mod spy era throwback where you goofily do missions and everything is just kind of janky and acid trippy and weird and uh, like really funny, but also just so, I don't know, I'm not sure what they were on when they made it, but it's great and you should play it. Um, I captured some video of myself just going through one of the first levels and we'll talk about why I think a lot of this stuff is funny afterwards. I'm afraid you don't have appointment. not really a platformer. This is the best part. <laughs> You're trying to retrieve some data disk is the uh, goal of the mission. Level one complete. Um, gosh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, why is that game so damn funny? Um, I, you know, this is where and the humor is so subjective that like with every slide, I have these fears that everyone's just gonna be like, that actually wasn't that funny. So this point is totally invalid. But I think it's, uh, it, it gets to really trade in association with all of these kind of kooky old janky sounds it works really tightly with the visuals um and i'll show you in this next example and this is probably totally not intended and maybe i'm just kind of you know um wailing on the developers of jazz punk here but here's an example of the sounds that happen when you go upstairs
I had a bug happen to me where, because uh, it seems like what's happening here is it's just, you know, a looping file of some dude just foleying himself in his own stairwell. It's like the most horrible indoor echoey lo-fi stairwell you can imagine for these outdoor metal stairs. Moreover, it's just like scrubbing the playhead along this loop that just doesn't change whether you're going up or down. And these are all super technical nitpicks that no one's going to think about. But what it ends up lending itself to is like, I think you can still tell that these stairs just sort of sound bad, like no offense, jazz punk developers, but they really, you know, if you were going to design these stairs and you weren't trying to be funny, you wouldn't do that. You'd record awesome metal footsteps and you'd make sure that visual sync was there. But when you get rid of all that junk and turn it into this looping mess, and actually what I had happen was I was going back down. I wasn't frapsing when this happened. But I got stuck on I, on one stair. The loop just stuck for some reason. So I was just standing on one stair, and it was just over and over going dunk 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 dunk. While I just stood in one place, and it was like the funniest moment in the entire game. And it was just like because of the entire aesthetic of this and the way they've established it, like look, stuff in this game is just crazy ass broken. Um, like you know the music, the with the saxophone is based off an emitter that is on that mission text that you just walk through. So then the second you go too far from it, it just cuts off, and you're like, wait, what the? Oh, I thought that was score, and then it's just like, oh crap, that was just an object. So it's taking your expectations and just like all over the place, just dashing them with like actually really crummy, you know, non-danger filled sort of versions of the stuff that you would think it's trying to do by not trying to be real over and over again it's just i don't know it's great um stairs like that if you heard stairs like that in gears of war again i don't need to pick on gears of war at all because it sounds great um yeah i just keep i just keep saying it it's like i'm thinking of what's an archetypal like triple a game oh gow um but if stairs like in gears of war for example or any game sounded like that you'd be like that person did a really shitty job on stairs in jazz puck i think that's actually freaking brilliant um, you can just whip out your H1 and like tumble around in your apartment and it's just like instant hilarity. So yeah, that game is great and it's pretty cheap. I hate when I go to one of these talks and all they've done is, you know, done case studies and research that again, they weren't thinking of when they did the thing and you leave feeling like what the hell you just justified a bunch of stuff. Um, so, you know, as an example, um, I have some sounds of my own that I brought so these are going to be, um, you know, divorced from uh, from context again. So um, I do a lot of character type stuff. This is for a game I worked on at some point. Um, there are a bunch of different genres of ways you can be funny, depending on what the expectation is. You can play with them. Sometimes slapstick works really well um, as a goofy enter type noise. I made something like this. That's not a sound I would try to sneak into, again, some crazy kind of AAA type game. Um, but the layers of it, I think the fact that it trades in such that classic kind of old Hanna-Barbera aesthetic. This is the first thing that I tried to make where I was really like, gosh, how am I going to be funny? And the first thing everybody does and they try to be funny is they go to the well of Hanna-Barbera sounds and they just use all of them. When I've worked with uh, content creators, and I start to try to pitch them of the aesthetic of what I'm looking for, they will always come back with Hanna-Barbera stuff and they're off the bat. And that's like totally okay because those sounds are just classically funny. I mean, when you hear them, you don't even really have to make a judgment of them because your brain just goes, oh yeah, that's that thing from that cartoon. And that cartoon was sort of funny. Like you just don't even really have to do the thinking. They're just on tap humor. They're great. Um, but you also would feel kind of lazy if you just used them. So if you're going to actually go back and use stuff and go for the slapstick thing, you want to try to work in as much of your own stuff as you can. Try to recreate it, basically. Like, listen to the old Hanna-Barbera stuff and be like, what is in there that's actually funny about that sound? And then make it yourself. Um, you'll get way better results. Some layers kind of going on there. And gosh, this, this section could take forever. Um, you know, got the initial sort of just like body fall enter. I mean, that's just great. Yeah. Uh, this is like the rough part that I did in the last day, day or two. Um, so one of the layers of the hit is going to be that wobbling nonsense. One of the layers is going to be this thing with me using my mouth to just go boof. Pretty awesome. Play it again. Yeah, that's great. 
Um, and then, you know, the cartoon classic clangy bang. I don't know exactly what they did, but that pipe sound is just so good. Like I knew I just wanted it in there as some sort of element. So these sorts of sounds are super goofy. Um, a lot of stuff that I made in this vein, when this guy gets damaged and I needed funny damage sounds for him, um, I did stuff like this. Oh, those fade out way quicker than I thought. Not great either. So, um, that is obviously just pure slapstick type of aesthetic. Again, you've got uh, the mouth noise in there. Always, always just get mouth noises in there. They're going to make whatever you're trying to make funny or just guaranteed um, if you do it yourself. Um, there's more of a bend, more of like a wobble, of like I think it's a rubber duck in there. And then some weird kind of stuttery type thing that uh, again has that kind of fall off tonality, but it's also got, you know, that classic kind of ricochet sound sort of worked in there, which again is trying to like hide the really funny sound you instantly do the association with of, oh, that's that goofy, harmless version of a ricochet that's from a cartoon. So if I try to make a damage sound, I'm not going to use like crazy blood and guts bone punching. I'm going to make it sound like this dude's made out of rubber. Like there's a duck that plays for some reason. Um, it's like someone took a metal plate and is doing this, even though. Um, so again, trying to go for the sort of not realistic version of that. I took pictures of some plugins and track layouts in case you guys care, but I'm pretty sure what you're going to see in most of these is I use when I'm making funny stuff, a crap load of filtering, um, especially like modulated filtering wobbles all over the place. A lot of pitching informant shifting type stuff. Um, I like little alter boy a whole lot. Delays I use a ton too. Again, delays with heavy modulation. Anything that moves a lot, um, expressiveness and pitch and like musicality is a great way to take a otherwise serious sound and just make it sort of goofy. Um, I don't know. I found that that always sort of lightens things up. Um, all sorts of crazy stuff in here, including the gun ricochet, you know, just nylon whips, me doing my voice pop noises, a duck call. Balloons. I find they're just freaking hilarious. I don't know why, I just love them. You know, so that's sort of one genre there. Again, you know, with an example of just kind of mouth noises you might make all the time. If I try to make a sound generally, and I'm trying to make a funny version of it, I'll do it with my mouth first. And then I'll go back and add whatever other sort of layers it needs after I've taken like a mouth pass and sort of, you know, doubled it or format shifted it way down or added reverb, whatever, to bulk it up. Um, and I'll tell you, a lot of the time, you'll find that you don't really need to add a whole lot if your mouth sound is kind of good and leaving it as mostly just mouth sound um, can be good. So instead of, you know, picking out wins where I'm like, I want that classic kind of scratchy, you know, 60s cartoon like wind type that everybody knows that stock sound. So just kind of doing a bunch of mouth stuff and like delaying it and verbing it and making your own crummy kind of cheesy version of a wind as opposed to using an actual wind is maybe going to be a funnier version of a wind because it's got that lighthearted, playful like I faked it you expected a real wind and some part of you might know that hey that's just a dude who was whizzing you know into a mic so you know that's slapstick there's there's you know cute humor um this is just like a character sort of jumping and like clicking some heels together so you've got sort of this thing. This kind of like a neat little, again, the playful sort of pitch up sparkly type thing. And then the way to just sort of make sure you lighten it up even more. Uh, put in little mouth sounds and instead of like an actual heel click or something like that, just do a little with your mouth. And it sounds super low grade and weird offline, but I promise you it's freaking hilarious. When you see the video, I can't show you. <laughs> Uh, that's the same one. Uh, this would be like a kind of reaction um, type, just mouth agape, like, oh my God, what just happened sort of thing. So again, the sounds kind of going on there. Squeaks, just they're great. Use them all the time. 
low sort of drummy type hits with you know wobbly filters on them so many wobbles um i love them a lot and you know all that kind of stuff again anything with modulation and movement that just sort of takes the pitch and does something with it an easy way if you have if you need to make something funny that's not funny to an actual video like the animation i'm working with here is literally just somebody with their mouth dropping open but i needed a funny sound in the background that said ha ha wobbles and boings and squeaks and all sorts of harmless non-dangerous type sounds as it turns out are pretty good for it another expectation subversion type thing these are from um bu -bu 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 -bu, put on the pkf so i don't preview it this is like um, kind of like a robot sort of flying in like jet propelled type thing um, and landing. So uh, I don't know what you guys think, but I don't think that sounds like a particularly dangerous robot. A lot of the layers in there um, and for this dude were just pure mouth noises that I tried to push as far into sounding like mechanical stuff as I could. I'll play back some of the layers, the mouth stuff. So all sorts of just like zips and zeers and again, why like look for servos and the sounds of engines doing that when you can just do that? Why look for the sound of a crappy sputtery engine instead of a real engine when you can just go I mean, sounds really janky and it feels almost like cheating the first time you like, it's like doing Foley. When somebody does a Foley pass and they just nail all the sync on it and there's nothing more to do in post, you're just like, holy crap, that was so damn fast. If I cut that from a library, that would have taken me forever. When you make a mouth pass, it just sort of like sits in the pocket there. It feels like, I don't know, really nice. Cause you're like, I did all that and I didn't even have to use anything else and barely process it. Mechanics that are in there. You know, instead of real engines and stuff, use hair dryers. Use really lightweight, kind of crummy sounding versions of engines instead of the real thing. The crash. You know, just should sound like super junky as opposed to a super techy, like, like a powerful sign divey kind of. Um, again, so it's a lot. Like, this isn't stuff I thought about at the time, but uh, a lot of what I realized my comedy in this project has come down to is, like, fake epic. Um, and I, I think that quote about, you know, laughter being a good signaler of the absence of danger really does sort of mesh up with a lot of the stuff I do. It's never the crazy, harmless, real version of a thing. It's always the, you know, crummy mouth noise guy in a studio version of a thing. Um, it seems to work okay. The servos... They're all just mouth servos um, because I couldn't find like a servo that wasn't overused and didn't I like tried like a maker bot and all sorts of goofy objects, but it was easier to just do something by myself and use some plugins. Yeah, there's my Skrillex devil voice preset. You guys are wondering what that is. I don't really know what that is. I think it was something that just did that kind of low, like, like weirdness to it. And I had it dialed to like 1%, but I just I had to, I found it when I was paging through stuff and I'm like naming it. Oh my God. Bitspeak is a plugin I used a ton for this. Uh, it is a cool, like $39 VST. That is a great speak and spell emulator. Um, and that's, if you're trying to make some sort of robot type thing, that's not dangerous. Why not make it sound like some crappy toy from the eighties as opposed to like real creepy digital speech. And uh, so then I, you know, did a lot of just running mouth noises and junk through that too to try to make like cool digital sounding stuff out of my voice. And, you know, those servos and all of that organic stuff became like the whole palette of everything. So the composite picture is just really janky. And then there's the voice on top of it too that, you know, I won't play, but um, is also pretty, pretty goofy. Um, this is for me particularly <laughs> fat character when this is sort of... So that's just sort of like kind of appearing out of nowhere. Um, and there's like some beeping device obviously involved. Um, a tremendous amount of that is just me um, with like some balloon and plunger pops for him coming out. Um, but the beeps are just kind of, you know, 
Uh, there's a lot of my voice in there, just kind of doing little brit, 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 and then just like little alter boying it and stacking it with some weird pitched like eagle type beeps and just other harmless sounds. And then I was like, oh, I need to make a sound because it looks like their beeping light stays on and he like charges up. Just you're watching it and just go brit, and then just throw it in and like when it's kind of cute and funny and not a dangerous version of a beep like an explosion you're like cool that'll stick one thing i'll say about mouth noise is that like i'll say use them a ton um but really try to disguise them because if you just leave them in there super naked they are going to sound super lo-fi like i get i bet in jazz punk you could get away with just like mouth noises and just not giving a shit like just kind of open a door and just go and like you could that that sound would totally fit in there you don't have to do anything but a lot of other times, like, you're going to want to, I mean, just throw a filter or something on it. You know, don't be that guy. There was a VFS. <sighs> there was a project I saw at VFS at one point, one of the assignments in one of our terms in which we had to do a sound redesign. And someone did it entirely with their mouth. And it did not come across as intentionally funny. It came across as, I did this at the last minute funny. Um, and I'm not going to edit anything and just use my voice. So, like, this... That technique can totally fail if you don't put in the work to, you know, make it sound cool. I like this sound a lot. I called it the rank for some reason, but again, it's just watching like this, any tiny bit of movement that you can accentuate with, with instead of an actual, like look at all the things in jazz punk when you pick up a whistle, when you kind of like bring your hand up. I mean, if you go and listen to like Ren and Stimpy, those old cartoons, it's all the old musical violin, rosin, like that little tonality just sucks like all of the potentially realistic, dangerous sort of stuff out of a situation. So if you see a thing move, yeah, I need a sound there. Well, I could do like a real whoosh or I could just go like and then just, you know, do some stuff on it. It just sounds ridiculous. Um, totally stupid. No analog in real life, but it kind of works. And yeah, so again, just filtering little alter boy and then fab filter too. Like I have a couple of presets in fab filter that really just kind of juice these like middle bands in funny resonant ways and i have one that i just call cutify and i throw it on pretty much everything um like my default plugin selection for this making funny stuff is they're all sitting there inactive but it's like fab filter filter freak 2 little alter boy and then you know maybe like a crystallizer or something but it's like i would say on like 90 percent of the sounds i make i turn all three of those on uh, and that's just like the hole I'm in now. There are plenty of other ways to make a sound, even a funny one, but that shit works for me. So, you know, some damaged stuff. Um, character is pretty fat. So I'm like, I want like a good big old, just like boing. I don't want like, I want to just hear the blubber of this dude is when I looked at him, like that's what I want to sell. Cause I don't know, really fat cartoon things are funny. Uh, maybe I just find them that way. I'm like the same way with, you know, like fat animals are kind of funny. Anybody? No? <laughs> I really like fat animal pictures. So. Yeah, they don't don't check your browser history after this. Uh, there are subreddits. So I think that's all my mouth. So using like real smack seemed weird, and then this guy like when I just look at him, you just think of that that low when you're watching a fat cartoon character, you're just like. Boom, boom, boom that kind of blurbly like low and so i was just working that in like everywhere every time you moved every time there's any kind of shake i just do some kind of like like fat moving just like all of that goofy stuff and just make it super low and doofy sounding just i would say doofy is the aesthetic i went through with this guy and i struggled a bunch and then coming around to that it was like yes doofy clicks like you make some dumb voice and you hear it and you're like oh that's gonna be it and, you know, the plug-in chain for making the wobble wave, the kind of... It's just taking your voice and then a couple octaves down with Little Alter Boy and putting all sorts of wobbly junk on it. Low wobbly sounds. Again, they work for me, you know. Weird, gross mouth flaps. It was literally like watching the dude shake and sitting in front of the mic just going... <laughs> And trying to like do passes where I'd get like more cheek and less like because <laughs> I had my nose just going into all of them. <laughs> that one came out okay. Um, that's a boing. Vocalizing things is good. 
Uh, I didn't really want to play a ton of voice stuff, but like this guy's voice just came out pretty just doofy and I don't know. Um, and oh. <laughs> get out of here. So, you know, that's me just like with every character I try to do that I try to make funny, I always try to find like one real life impression. I guess I, I do do a lot of impressions, like all this shit of me trying to be funny throughout most of my life to like fit in, I think has come in really handy because I've learned all these little side skills. Um, so if you're like a really unfunny person and you're hoping for hard and fast rules of like just how to be like, you're not just going to leave here being funny. Um, you know, like if you want to be comedic at anything, just practice being comedic at something and then the same sense of timing and everything I feel like carry over. Um, but again, there I think is a pretty decent example of like, if that dude sounded dangerous or realistic instead of like, you know, some weird pitch shifted version of like Mr. Dink from Doug, um, I don't know if it would be funny. Um, but yeah, finding that kind of goofiness I think works. Universally funny stuff. Again, I've been saying over and over, it's all about context, subverting the context, remove the danger and stuff. But is there anything you can do all the time that's just funny? I already showed you the example, so you pretty much already know what I'm going to say. Um, try these. Nonsense speech, imitations. That stuff wins doubly because they bring that human element in of the sense of socialization. Like, you don't want to laugh by yourself, but if it feels like there's another kind of character in some actually personalized thing there, it's funny. Why is the robot thing in jazz punk that you go and walk up to and click on funny? Because it's kind of like a vaguely weird human sound and it brings all these other kind of emotions subtly in with it. It's like, and there's the text there, like, all I need is a human heart. But if you clicked on that robot and it just went, like you'd probably also laugh at it because like that's not what a robot's supposed to make and that sounds like a person it's like no oh, you're gonna feel things like there's a person there where if it just went you'd be like yeah that's what a robot's supposed to do okay like what else can i click on rub squeaks tiny movements stretches wobbles and musical instruments these are all great things to have in the toolkit. Again, depending on your situation, you might not get to use these and have them be funny because they might just be totally against the grain of the aesthetic. Um, but they generally kind of work. I wish I knew more about the psychoacoustics of like why slapping a ruler on a table or like taking some rubber and going and those things are good, but the guys who designed all those like, you know, uh, imagineering like musical devices for Disney shit in the 50s were just clearly geniuses. Um, they were on to something. Plugins and techniques. If you have stuff that's not funny and you want to funify it with a plugin. Uh, again, I don't know that you can do this, but I thought I should include this slide because I always like to leave here feeling like, yeah, cool. I'm going to go do exactly what that guy said and I'll be exactly like him. So if you want to try that. Um, See if it works. Um, just use a ton of filtering in, you know, the design for this stuff. Just sweeping movement wobbles, you know, tons of goofy resonance. Just anything to take the, I guess, kind of the reality out of a sound and like make it move around. Again, movement and pitch changes are just inherently goofy. Um, again, pitch shifting. Uh, I love Little Alter Boy because it's cheap and it's just really neat for doing pitch shifty stuff. Um, I use a lot of delays uh, when I'm trying to make, you know, like loops of things and energy type things, um, but I don't want them to sound particularly dangerous. I was trying to really make a lot of like um, cartoony magic, like, you know, those cool uh, things from like Bewitched and stuff from the 60s and like the, the Shira and the He-Man like sort of power type things where they hold up their thing and there's that awesome like that cool. And it was just taking a lot of stuff and throwing like delays with like lots of wobble and lots of movement on them. Just like, I don't know, listen, really, it seems so dumb, but I'd sit there and be like, God, I really want to make that sound. And like, oh, I'll just use that sound and start throwing a bunch of plugins on it. And then it was way easier to just go, no dude, stop. Listen to that sound. Like what's actually happening there. Just like pull back for a second and like, just figure out what they did. Like sometimes you forget that you can do that. You just hear a sound. You think it's cool. I'm going to use it, but instead just audition it and like, leave it in sound minor 
and just like play it over and over again and go, okay, yeah, no, that does sound like there's a bit of like a delayed thing in there. Oh, okay. I recognize that as an LFO of like, it's kind of, I guess, good training to go through. I don't do it enough. But when I would get stuff back that was clearly like, hey, you wanted a funny thing. I made a thing with a bunch of, you know, cartoon sounds in it. It's like, no, dude, like I've tried that and it's kind of too obvious. Like it's a really cheap shot. Like listen to those. They are funny, but think about why they were or just try to emulate them with other stuff. Um, honestly, that's just good practice for anything. And mouth noises. Um, you know, they're great. Score everything. Uh, I've actually not played any of like the Don't Starve stuff that apparently has Gord doing, you know, imitation animals and things all over it. Uh, anytime I have to do an animal and I'm trying to make it funny, I just don't use the animal and it's probably going to work. Like people can make amazing impressions. There's a guy at my studio I discovered that's like the greatest dolphin impersonator known to man. And I had need of making a dolphin. And it was so freaking cool because this guy signed up. I was recording people for just like developer VO. And uh, this dude wanted to, hey, I signed up for the dolphin thing. And I was like, oh, that's great, man. Like nobody signed up for the dolphin thing. And like, <laughs> because like I couldn't really think of what to do with it. Like it's kind of a, not a really interesting thing. Like what are you going to do for a dude with a dolphin? And he just does this crazy like, <laughs> and just starts doing this like, I mean, that's like 10 times worse than what he did. He came in, this guy just sounded like Flipper. And I just was like, holy shit. This is this guy's moment, right? Like he, he apparently he's like, yeah, I've just always had like his mild superpowers. He's been just great at making dolphin noises his whole life. And I was like, dude, you were just born to play this. So now anytime there's like a squeaky type animal thing that I need to make, I go and find this guy and I'm like, hey man, you want to come back in? I need you to try a squirrel. I need you to try a mouse. You think you can do that? And he's like, oh, oh uh, I don't know. I mean, I've really only ever done dolphins. I'm like, I'm like, no man, I believe. I think if you have a dolphin in you, you know, like we're, we're going to take you big time, dude. I got all, all sorts of plans for your weird animal voice thing. Like that's going to be your gimmick. You're like the Frank Welker of PopCap. So get in here. Um, and he's done pretty well. Uh, so yeah, you know, funnier version of a thing again is impersonating a thing. Um, sometimes poorly and then try to disguise some of the poorness with having the other sounds there be cool, but have like one poor layer there to just let people know, you know, weren't, weren't. It's not actually a dolphin. Also, like, good luck finding the exact dolphin sounds you need. I mean, what dolphin libraries out there of like, okay, we're doing a take where he's sad. We're doing a take. You know, that doesn't exist. So uh, maybe like Tim Preble's got one. I don't know. Um, so if you take away nothing else, the birding context, you know, the expectation is here with it's a super dangerous red faction game and here's a unicorn gun. Robots usually sound like this. Instead, it's a dude making some servos with his mouth and now they sound like this. Like always just be one step ahead of them. And the more you understand the audience, the more you know kind of what you can get away with in terms of skewing that. So remove the danger. Uh, timing is huge. Um, I was trying to ask people at PopCap like their examples of funny sounds or their definitions of humor or anything like that. And one of the guys was like, oh yeah, have you heard the joke? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, what's the fastest way to kill a joke? Timing. And I was like, <laughs> I, and I honestly didn't get it for like a minute. And then I was like, oh, that's so good, dude. Cause I, I get it. Cause yeah, the time was really, sh oh, okay. So it's not funny when, you, yeah. Yeah. And that again is one of those senses you just kind of have to learn over time. But, um, Hopefully if the visual artists and stuff are on your side, like all sorts of little unexpected delays or just bits of jank that you kind of introduce to soften things up can be great for that. Uh, also silence can be hilarious. Um, if the expectation is a thing makes a sound and it kind of doesn't really make a sound or you've got some epic explosion and it just goes, <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what I was waiting for. Like what the fuck, you know, that, um, I did swear on this. Darn it. <laughs> Uh, and seriously, mouth noises. So, um, pretty much it. I think, you know, it's a good informal shit shooting, as Jesse put it earlier today. Uh, anybody have any questions? Like, honestly, I'm figuring this stuff out as I go, and a lot of what I dug up today is just me trying to, you know, vaguely justify it for the sake of making a talk. So thanks for having me here. But, um, I have a lot to learn, and, uh... You know, anything you guys know, like I will take because I still have need of being funny for like several more months uh, and I'm starting to run out of mouth noises. So, yeah, uh, sure. Do you, do you have a background in computer science?
No. No. Um, are, are you doing most of your stuff in Wise? In yeah. Wise? Yeah, all my implementation is in Wise. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it would make you like largely more employable if you were like fluent in kind of C plus plus or something? Or? Uh, I'd say C sharp would be a great one to do now. Yep. Um, one of the guys at PopCap, uh, R.J. Mattingly, who I'm going to fawn over in his absence right now, is like, you know, he's a sound designer. He's a technical sound designer. It started at the same time as I did. Um, PopCap, we use Unity a bunch. You know, spoilers. I mean, who doesn't use Unity, right? That's not like a big thing. Um, Unity, you know, is the bones of that are all in C sharp, the way that it talks to Wise and like where that stuff meets the metal, all C sharp. Um, if you know just a basic amount of it in terms of like getting it to talk to the audio engine, you already know like enough to probably call yourself a technical sound designer and you could like do tutorials to figure that out in, you know, a couple of days. Um, learning that stuff is incredibly flexible because it lets you take the ability like finding where the people on your, cause you, the nice thing about Unity and C Sharp, this is kind of a tangent, but, um, all that stuff is like fairly surface level. There generally isn't going to be like a ton of, you know, deep, some deep, you know, obfuscated kernel of C++ that like only a couple of developers know about that's like sitting in there and you can't find in source control and you don't touch. I mean, a lot of Unity is based in these like component scripts. It's a lot of scripts. Like I feel like the code structure of it is fairly flat and spread out. And so if you get handy with C Sharp, you can go in there and RJ has done this and be a total hero for your audio team and find the spaces where different things are being triggered and different events are being you know called and like nestle your little play event things in there or like nestle your little thing that says hey increment this rtpc when this happens um you know even more powerfully you can build your own scripts that act as like components which are just little like chunks of code you can tack on to something someone else does so it's like i have this reusable thing that just bangs out a play event that is like this you know concatenated string of naming stuff that's based on what i attached it to so like anytime I find something that I know I want to put a sound on, I just put that there and I know it's going to make a play event called play underscore what the name of that thing is. And like, I didn't have to ask a programmer, hey, can you put that event on there for me? Like I have a thing that I can just hook wherever I want a play event, just kind of click add component, boop, and that's what it does. Um, and it's kind of, it's not super complicated code, but like having that stuff just opens a ton of freedom. You will make yourself really useful as an implementer and technical sound designer if you like the more you can free yourself from needing programmers and c sharp is i think a good a good place to go for it like if i honestly i feel like i'm probably going to end up not having a job in a few years if i don't learn c sharp so i'll get there um yeah why is this dope and i know nothing about fmod so don't ask me about fmod because <laughs> i haven't used it since john fish's class <laughs> so uh yeah. So in addition to your um, not noise toolbox, I just imagine you having sort of like a toy chest next to your chair full of like go to props. Mm. Am I making that up? Do you have some like fun props? We do have stuff like that around the office and I will I, I don't do as much recording as I as I mean to. Um, but sometimes the inspiration does strike. And yeah, toys are brilliant because what are they if not just like comical, safe sounding associations that you'd make with like larger sounds like if i need some crazy kind of gong or something like that why don't i just take my two coffee mugs and just bang them together and then do like a weird pitchy type thing on that instead of looking for a real gong if i need to make sparklers or fire or something like that why don't i just in addition to doing a lot of like that kind of stuff take like pop rocks and just there's my sparkler type element instead of an actual sparkler. Like it's a lot of playing and substitution. And then of course, if you want, I mean, rattles and like cheap plasticky sounds and like grinders and things like that, like they're just, they're good. And you know what's really funny? And I mean, I can't think of a place I've used it, but would just could fit anywhere is those freaking little like cow things that you turn over and do them. Those are so good. I don't know what the point of them is. Like their their very existence is to be funny, right? Record that and like your job's done. So <laughs> that's why someone made that thing. It is funny, right? Uh, I don't have a giant chest, but certainly you, you do well to accumulate that kind of stuff, you know? Tiny sounds are a lot funnier than, than big sounds. 
unless the game is tiny sounding and then suddenly the dude does some little move and you just drop in the dopest like shattering like you know stuttery explosion ever you know and then go back to cuteness like that'd probably be pretty funny so you can go the other way too but you know most of the time little sounds mouth sounds are little I, I pitch up a lot more than I pitch down yeah. I so I was curious, uh, as far as your environment, your work environment goes, how yeah. do you run the sounds past people, or do you just put them in and let them surprise? Oh, yeah. Them? So, honestly, like, uh, my process for knowing if it works, if I make myself laugh, like, if that ever happens, I mean, it's pretty much just going to stay in there. Like, I don't care what other people say. Like, that's past the <laughs> test for me. If you can make yourself genuinely laugh, like, that seems really tough, right? I've done it once or twice, and, you know, I'll just pat myself on the back. So when that happens, like, that'll stick. But if you I, just gut check it, just leave your door open when you're like, you feel like you're just kind of cresting the ridge on a sound that you think is kind of funny and like, yeah, I'm just uh, playing back some stuff. And then maybe someone will take the bait and walk by and be like, oh, dude, what is that? Like, that's really, can I see that? And they, they start laughing. You're like, nice. All right, cool. That's sticking it. Like, I just gut check it by kind of like letting people maybe wander in and say stuff is cool or not. Sometimes they don't take it or... Um, you know, sometimes you get weird reactions. Like I was doing something where um, there's a character who was shooting some stuff and a sound I was making was, again, trying to subvert expectations of there not really being a lot of gun sounds in pop cap games because, you know, those are, that's violent and our games are not. Like you, we break jewels and, you know, um, and that got a lot of reactions. Like everybody just came from down the hall. Like, what the hell are you working on? Like, we, I never hear gunshots in this hallway ever. Like, I got to know what's going on in there, but... Yeah, it's very open door like that. Um, I want to say the devs and the rest of the team listen to sounds, but generally they'll only tell me if something is really bad or they won't notice it. So um, we've done a lot of mixed passing lately that is making it more enjoyable for people to hear things, though. So we're starting to get feedback. All right. Uh, well, you know, thank you very much for having me here. You know, my final, in case for some reason you want to go to my website after this, like there's nothing there but a blog and I'm, I already have a job right now, so I'm good. Um, but yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, I try to be pretty funny there and sometimes I talk about sound uh, and also the game audio slack is awesome. So there's just a plug there. Just hang out in that thing all day. Yep. Thanks Vancouverites for setting that up. And, um, you know, thanks for having me up here. Like, as a random aside, people have been asking, like, yeah, so what's the deal with, like, Damien was talking to me the other day, but who, yeah, Gordon and Matt are running that, uh, that Vancouver Sound Design meetup these days. And I'm like, yeah, dude, when Jesse and I were back in school, this is like, back in the day of SD49, you know, you know, 2011, like, there wasn't really a game audio meetup scene here at all. And, in fact, I felt like the environment around Vancouver was very much just like, yeah, get out. Just while, while you still can, like graduate, and then it's a depressed economy. Our dollar is high. You're in the pond with everybody else who doesn't have a job. Like, you should probably just leave. And so a lot of us did. And now it's like two, three years later, like, you guys are crushing it. And there's this ridiculously cool game design and sound design community up here now. And uh, like, I don't know how it happened. Like, did you do it? <laughs> or like, because you started just working on cool indie shit, and then there's also power up, and like Ed, you stuck it out, and you know, you've made it work. But like, I don't know, this grassroots thing has just emerged, and if I were graduating now, I totally wouldn't leave. Um, but Seattle's pretty cool too, so it's fine.